Hello and welcome to the episode 26 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Some of today's highlights include the writing of a new song, an acoustic performance for a friend, and a bright idea. Let's see. On the 26th of January 1961, the Beatles, featuring Pete Best on drums, played the Little Land Town Hall in Liverpool. It was their third visit to the venue, after the sensational return from their first Hamburg trip in December 1960. In 1962, the Cavern Club in Liverpool hosted another double feature for the lads, with Pete Best still on drums, with a lunchtime and an evening concert. Having honoured their engagement with the Cavern, the Beatles rushed to the Tower Ballroom in Wallasey to perform at another event, this time put on by promoter Sam Leach. Another busy night in 1963 with the Beatles engaged in two different venues. First, they performed at the El Rio Club in Macclesfield. The concert had been rescheduled from the original 19th of January date. The Beatles shared the bill with Wayne Fontana and the Jets. Another curiosity is that it was in the backstage of this venue that John Lennon and Paul McCartney started writing their song, Misery. Their idea was to give the song to Helen Shapiro, who they would have met in the coming week, during their first UK tour. For the second engagement of the day, the band had to drive south for 21 miles, about 34 kilometers, to reach the King's Hall in Stroke-on-Trent. According to Beatlesbible.com, the only thing to make the performance stand out from the others in the same period was a one-off cover of Wall Cry It In, a song by the Rooftop Singers, then number one in the United States. The Beatles would never cover it again. Since we're talking about Beatlesbible.com, please notice that the website says that it was the King's Hall backstage that saw the birth of Misery, but I tend to side with Beatles historian Mark Lewison's version of the story. Being a composer myself, I think it's not likely that Lennon and McCartney started writing at the end of a long night of work. It would also be unlikely that the writing took place before the Stroke on Trent performance, since the band had to drive to the venue, probably not at a leisurely pace, having had another engagement beforehand. Naturally, everything is possible, although I think it's highly unlikely that Beatlesbible.com is correct. In 1964, the Beatles performed for yet another night during their residency at the Olympia Theatre in Paris, France. One year later, in 1965, George Martin broke a bone in his foot while on holiday with the Lennons and his girlfriend in St. Moritz, Switzerland. Unable to ski after the injury, Martin was treated by Lennon with an acoustic performance of a song he had written recently, having the provisional title of This Bird Has Flown. This was later renamed Norwegian Wood. Let's move to 1969 to find the Beatles working in the studio with Billy Preston, despite being a Sunday. It had been quite a while since the band had worked both days in a weekend, but the approaching of February, which would mark the end of the availability of Ringo Starr, forced them to rush to complete the Get Back project. The session began with the arrival of Ringo and George. The latter performed Isn't It a Pity, Let It Down and Window Window acoustically. After that, he helped Ringo with the composition of Octopus's Garden. When the others arrived, the band focused on Let It Be and The Long and Winding Road, with Paul on piano, John on bass and Preston on organ. Then, the band recorded a second, shorter version of Dig It. This was the version used both on the prototype Get Back Master Tapes and on the Larry B album, but it was abbreviated in both cases. The 12 minute 25 second recording was faded out after 8 minutes and 27 seconds for Jones's prototype releases and was heard on Larry B with an edit lasting less than a minute. Apart from the usual array of covers, jams and the like, 
The session was memorable for two other details. The visit of Linda Eastman and her baby daughter Heather, and, according to Mark Lewison, the fact that at some point, somewhere at Apple, proposed that the Beatles could have an unannounced live performance on the roof of the Apple office building. The performance was meant to give a climaxing conclusion to the Get Back film. The fact that many people later claimed to have had the idea first is a testament of how well received it was. Finally, during the evening, Glenn Jones worked to a mixdown of some songs from the sessions during another 90 minute shift at the Olympic Sound Studios. Again, all details have been lost. On this date in 1970, Ringo Starr and his wife Maureen flew from London to Los Angeles to attend the premiere of The Magic Christian, the latest film featuring Ringo and the one which he started shooting in February 1969. On the same day, John Lennon, having left Denmark with his wife Yoko on the previous day, arrived in Paris and was interviewed by Reuters. The interview at the couple's Hilton Hotel was not terribly memorable, with Lennon giving short and grumpy replies to questions about the peace campaign and further plans by the Beatles. This concludes another episode of What A Fab Day. If you liked it, you might want to check the previous ones out, or visit www.simonmas.com support to find ways to support my efforts, even without spending a penny. In addition, in the episode description, you'll find a bibliography of the show with Amazon affiliate links that you can use to support the podcast with your shopping, and a link to a list of all the songs tried out, however briefly, during the Get Back sessions. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.